Good evening, y'all, and welcome to this first session of our reading of uh, Kwame Nkrumah's Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. We've been looking forward to uh, reading this uh, for a little while now. We've been putting it out there that we were going to read it in the server uh, for almost two months, so it's uh, finally time to go ahead and do it. As always, if you don't have a physical copy of the book, we got you covered. If you're here in the live Discord reading, then there is a pinned version of the book that you can uh, use to follow along. So check that. And if you're following along on the YouTube, you can find that same version of the book in the description. Very excited to read with y'all. So without further ado, let's get started. Kwame Nkrumah's Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. Introduction. The neocolonialism of today represents imperialism in its final and perhaps its most dangerous stage. In the past, it was possible to convert a country upon which a neocolonial regime had been imposed. Egypt in the 19th century is an example into a colonial territory. Today, this process is no longer feasible. Old-fashioned colonialism is by no means entirely abolished. It still constitutes an African problem, but is everywhere on the retreat. Once a territory has become nominally independent, it is no longer possible, as it was in the last century, to reverse the process. Existing colonies may linger on, but no new colonies will be created. In place of colonialism as the main instrument of imperialism, we have today neocolonialism. The essence of neocolonialism is that the state which is subject to it is, in theory, independent. It has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from outside. The methods and forms of this direction can take various shapes. For example, in an extreme case, the troops of the imperial power may garrison the territory of the neocolonial state and control the government of it. More often, however, neocolonialist control is exercised through economic or monetary means. The neocolonial state must, may be obliged to take the manufactured products of the imperialist power to the exclusion of competing products from elsewhere. Control over government's policy in the neocolonial state may be secured by payments toward the cost of running the state, by the provision of civil servants in positions where they can dictate policy, and by monetary control over foreign exchange through the imposition of a banking system controlled by the imperial power. Where neocolonialism exists, the power of uh, exercising control is often a state which formally ruled the territory in question. But this is not necessarily so. For example, in the case of South Vietnam, the former imperial, imperial power was France. But neo-colonial control of the state has now gone to the United States. It is possible that neo-colonial control may be exercised by a concertium of financial interests, which are not specifically identifiable with any particular state. The control of the Congo by great international financial concerns is a case in point. The result of neocolonialism is that foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than for the development of the less developed parts of the world. Investment under neocolonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between the rich and the poor countries of the world. Now, that's wild. He said the investment under neocolonialism increases rather than decreases the gaps between the rich and the poor countries of the world. So the more investment you find in terms of like, you know, finance capital, the more the wage disparity grows between um, the proletariat and the bourgeois. That's interesting. I've never seen that framing before, y'all. So the struggle against neocolonialism is not aimed at excluding the capital of the developed world from operating in less developed countries. It is aimed at preventing the financial power of the developed countries being used in such a way as to impoverish the less developed. Non-alignment, as practiced by Ghana and many other countries, is based on cooperation with all states, whether they be capitalist, socialist, or having a mixed economy. Such a policy, therefore, involves foreign investment from capitalist countries, but it must be invested in accordance with a national plan drawn up by the government of the non-aligned state with its own interest in mind. The issue is not what return the foreign investor receives on his investments. He may, in fact, do better for himself if he invests in a non-aligned country than if he invests in a neo-colonial one. The question is one of power. 
A state in the grip of neocolonialism is not master of its own destiny. It is this factor which makes neocolonialism such a serious threat to world peace. The growth of nuclear weapons has made out of date the old-fashioned balance of power which rested upon the ultimate sanction of a major war. Certainty of mutual mass destruction effectively prevents either of the great power blocks from threatening the other with the possibility of a worldwide war, and military conflict has thus become confined to limited wars. For these, neocolonialism is the breeding ground. They make conflict through, like, investments and, like, the competition between finance capital rather than, like, on-the-ground wars. Huh. I've heard that before, but I haven't seen the theory develop. Let's see how they develop this, y'all. So, such wars can, of course, take place in countries which are not neocolonialist controlled. Indeed, their object may be to establish in a small but independent country a neocolonialist regime. The evil of neocolonialism is that it prevents the formation of those large units which would make impossible limited war. To give one example, if Africa was united, no major power bloc would attempt to subdue it by limited war because from the very nature of limited war, what can be achieved by it itself limited, by it is itself limited. It is only where small states exist that it is possible by lending a few thousand marines uh, or by financing a mercenary force to secure a decisive result. The restriction of military action of limited war is, however, no guarantee of world peace and is likely to be the factor which will ultimately involve the great power blocks in a world war. However, much uh, both are determined to avoid it. Limited war, once embarked upon, achieves a momentum of its own. Of this, the war in South Vietnam is only one example. It escalates despite the uh, desire of the great power blocks to keep it limited. While this particular war may be prevented from leading to a world conflict, the multiplication of similar limited wars can only have one end. World war and the terrible consequences of nuclear conflict. Neocolonialism is also the worst form of imperialism. For those who practice it, it means power without responsibility, and for those who suffer from it, it means exploitation without redress. In the days of old-fashioned colonialism, the imperial powers had at least to explain and justify at home the actions it was taking abroad. In the colony, those who served the ruling imperial power could at least look to its protection against any violent move by their opponents. With neocolonialism, neither is the case. So, it's being argued that under neocolonialism, there isn't even a need for, like, this fake accountability that he says the, uh, capitalist class used to feel the pressure to do. Now, under the current construct, they don't even feel the need to uh, pretend that, they're, uh, that they have to be accountable. They feel like they can act without any kind of consequence as to their actions when it comes to the subject of uh, colonizing other people and engaging in imperialism. And I mean, we can see that to this day. I mean, how long now have we known about the lies uh, that got us into Iraq and Afghanistan and like what consequences have necessarily come from that y'all like there have been no consequences despite how long we've known we've known since at least 2005 that there were no WMDs for example in Iraq but nobody's ever going to face anything close to prosecution or the people's justice for that shit so above all Neocolonialism, like colonialism before it, postpones the facing of the social issues, which will have to be faced by the fully developed sector of the world before the danger of world war can be eliminated or the problem of world poverty resolved. Neocolonialism, like colonialism, is an attempt to export the social conflicts of the capitalist countries. The temporary success of this policy can be seen in the ever-widening gap between the richer and the poorer nations of the world. But the internal contradictions and conflicts of neocolonialism make it certain that it cannot endure as, as a permanent world policy. How it should be brought to an end is a problem that should be studied, above all, by the developed nations of the world, because it is they who will feel the full impact of the ultimate failure. The longer it continues, the more certain it is that, it is in, that its inevitable collapse will destroy the social system of which they have made it a foundation. The system for its development in the post-war period can be briefly summarized. The problem which faced the wealthy nations of the world at the end of the Second World War was the impossibility of returning to the pre-war situation in which there was a great gulf between the few rich and the many poor. 
irrespective of what particular political party was in power. Uh, the internal pressures in the rich countries of the world was such that no post-war capitalist country could survive unless it became a quote-unquote welfare state. There might be differences in degree in the extent of the social benefits given to the industrial and agricultural workers, but what was everywhere impossible was a return to the mass unemployment and to the low level of living of the pre-war years. From the end of the 19th century onwards, colonies have been regarded as a source of wealth which could be used to mitigate the class conflicts in the capitalist states. And as will be explained later, this policy had some success. But it failed in its ultimate object because the pre-war capitalist states were so organized uh, internally that the bulk of the profit made from colonial possessions uh, found its way into the pockets of the capitalist class and not to those of the workers. Far from achieving the object intended, the working class parties at times tended to identify their interests with those of the colonial peoples, and the imperialist powers found themselves engaged upon a conflict on two fronts, at home with their own workers and abroad against the growing forces of colonial liberation. The post-war inaugurated a very different colonial policy. A deliberate attempt was made to divert colonial earnings from the wealthy class and use them instead generally to finance the welfare state. As will be seen from the examples given later, this was the method consciously adopted even by those working class leaders who had before the war regarded the colonial peoples as their natural allies against their capitalist enemies at home. It's a dangerous conflation to make the idea that colonial peoples are allies against capitalists as if you're not saying the very same thing when you make such a proclamation. That's, that's wild. At first, it was presumed that this object could be achieved by maintaining the pre-war colonial system. Experience soon proved that attempts to do so would be disastrous and would only provoke colonial wars, thus dissipating the anticipated gains from the continuance of the colonial regime. Britain, in particular, realized that at an early stage, and the correctness of the British judgment at the time has subsequently been demonstrated by the defeat of French colonialism in the Far East and Algeria, and the failure of the Dutch to retain any of their former colonial empire. The system of neocolonialism was therefore instituted, and in a short run, it has served the developed powers admirably. It is in the long run that its consequences are likely to be catastrophic for them. Neocolonialism is based upon the principle of breaking up former large united colonial territories into a number of small non viable states, which are incapable of independent development and must rely upon the former imperial power for defense and even internal security. Their economic and financial systems are linked, as in colonial days, with those of the former colonial ruler. At first sight, the scheme would appear to have many advantages for the developed countries of the world. All the profits of neocolonialism can be secured if, in any given area, a reasonable proportion of the states have a neocolonialist system. It is not necessary that they all should have one. Unless small states can combine, they must be compelled to sell their primary products at prices dictated by the developed nations and buy their manufactured goods at the prices fixed by them. So long as neocolonialism can prevent political and economic conditions for optimum development, the developing countries, whether they are under neocolonialist control or not, will be unable to create a large enough market to support industrialization. Hmm. Let's repeat that. So long as neocolonialism can prevent political and economic conditions for optimum development, the developing countries, whether they are under neocolonialist control or not, will be unable to create a large enough market to support industrialization. In the same way, they will lack the financial strength to force the developed countries to accept their primary uh, products at a fair price. Uh, that's an important thing he's saying there, y'all, because as we know from uh, Mao's uh, theory of protracted war, one of the successful ways that you can resist capital is by having wielding enough political power. As such, um, you make the would-be colonizing people feel like that whatever it is, they would be trying to gain isn't worth it for everything that they'll lose. So if you do what he's talking about here in terms of uh, preventing political and economic conditions from developing optimally, you won't be able to uh, you won't be able to build political power in such a way that you can 
resist the superior uh, military might of the uh, of the colonial powers. So that's a that's very interesting that he uh, points that out. Uh, so in the neo colonialist uh, territories, since the former colonial power has in theory relinquished political political control. If the, if the social conditions occasioned by neocolonialism cause a revolt, the local neocolonialist government can be sacrificed and another equally subservient one substituted in its place. On the other hand, in any continent where neocolonialism exists on a wide scale, the same social pressures which can produce revolts and refuse to accept the system and therefore neocolonialist nations have already made weapon with which they can threaten their opponents if they appear successfully to be challenging a the system. These advantages, which seem at first sight so obvious, are, however, an examina on examination, illusory because they fail to take into consideration the world, the facts of the world today. The introduction of neocolonialism increases the rivalry between the great powers, which was provoked by the old style colonialism. However, little real power the government of a neocolonial state may possess. It must have, from the very fact of its nominal independence, a certain area of uh, maneuver. It may not be able to exist without a neocolonialist master, but it may still have the ability to change masters. The ideal neocolonialist state would be one which was wholly subservient to neocolonialist interest, but the existence of the socialist nation makes it impossible to enforce the full rigor of the neocolonialist system. The existence of an alternative system is itself a challenge to the neo-colonialist regime. Warnings about the, quote, da the dangers of communist subversion, close quote, are likely to be too edged since they bring to the notice of those living under a neo-colonialist system the possibility of a change of regime. In fact, neo-colonialism is the victim of its own contradictions. In order to make it attractive to those upon whom it is practiced, it must be shown as capable of raising their living standards. But the economic object of neocolonialism is to keep those standards depressed in the interest of the developed countries. It is only then, when this contradiction is understood, that the failure of innumerable aid programs, many of them well-intentioned, can be explained. In the first place, the rulers of neocolonial neo -colonial states derive their authority to govern not from the will of the people, but from the support which they obtain from their neo-colonialist masters. They have therefore little interest in developing education, strengthening the bargaining power of their workers employed by expatriate firms, or indeed of taking any step which would challenge the colonial pattern of commerce and industry. It is the object of neo-colonialism to preserve. Aid, therefore, to a neo-colonial state is merely a revolving credit paid by the neo-colonial master passing through the neocolonial state and returning to the neocolonial master in the form of increased profits. Huh. So aid is an investment itself that they that they that they expect to see a return on investment on, huh? I wonder how um, Nkrumah would have said the US profits off of like its so called aid to like Israel, for example. I wonder if he'll get into that or if there's some research to be done on that. That'd be interesting. Secondly, it is in the field of aid that the uh, rivalry of individual developed uh, states first manifest itself. So long as neocolonialism persists, so long will spheres of interest persist. And this makes multilateral aid, which is in fact the only effective form of aid, impossible. Once multilateral aid begins, the neocolonialist masters are faced by the hostility of uh, the vested interest in their own country. Their manufacturers naturally object to any attempt to raise the price of the raw materials which they obtain from the neocolonialist territory in question, or to the establishment there of manufacturing industry, which might compete directly or indirectly with their own export to the territory. Even education is suspect as likely to produce a student movement, and it is, of course, true that in many less developed countries, the students have been in the vanguard of the fight against neocolonialism, of course. In the end, the situation arises that the only type of aid which the neocolonialist masters consider as safe is military aid. Once a neocolonialist territory is brought to such a state of economic chaos and mystery, that revolt actually breaks out 
then and only then is there no limit to the generosity of the neo-colonial overlord, provided, of course, that the funds supplied are utilized exclusively for military purposes. Military aid, in fact, marks the last stage of neo-colonialism, and its effects is self-destructive. Sooner or later, the weapons supplied pass into the hands of the opponents of the neo-colonialist regime, and the war itself increases the social misery which originally provoked it. Neocolonialism is a millstone around the necks of the developed countries which practice it. Unless they can rid themselves of it, it will drown them. Previously, the undeveloped powers could escape from the contradictions of neocolonialism by substituting for it direct colonialism. Such a solution is no longer possible, and the reasons for it have been well explained by Mr. Owen Lattimore, the United States Far Eastern expert and advisor to Xi'an Kashyyyk in the immediate post-war period. He wrote, Asia, which was so easily and swiftly subjugated by conquerors in the 18th and 19th centuries, displaying an amazing ability stubbornly to resist modern armies equipped with aeroplanes, tanks, motor vehicles, and artillery. Formerly, big territories were conquered in Asia with small forces. The income, first of all, from plunder, then from direct taxes, and lastly from trade, capital investments, and long-term exploitation covered with incredible speed the expenditure for military operations. This arithmetic represented a great temptation to strong countries. Now they have run up against another arithmetic, and it discourages them. The same arithmetic is likely to apply throughout the less developed world. This book is therefore an attempt to ex examine neocolonialism, not only in its African context and its relation to African unity, but in world perspective. Neocolonialism is by no means exclusively an African question. Long before it was practiced on any large scale in Africa, it was an established system in other parts of the world. Nowhere has it proved successful, either in raising living standards or in ultimately benefiting the countries which have, ind which have indulged in it. Marx predicted that the growing gap between the wealth of the possessing classes and the workers it employs would ultimately produce a conflict fatal to capitalism in each individual capitalist state. Yeah, that's definitely holding true today, isn't it, y'all? This conflict between the rich and the poor has now been transferred on to the international scene. But for proof of what is acknowledged to be happening, it is no longer necessary to consult the classical Marxist writers. The situation is set out with the utmost clarity in the leading organs of capitalist opinion. Take, for example, the following extracts from the Wall Street Journal, the newspaper which perhaps best reflects United States capitalist thinking. In its issue of May 12, 1965, under the headlines of Poor Nations Plight, the paper's first analysis, which countries are considered industrial and which backward, there is, it explains, no rigid method of classification. Nevertheless, it points out, quote, a generally used breakdown, however, has recently been maintained by the International Monetary Fund because in the words of an IMF official, the economic demarcation in the world is getting increasingly apparent. The breakdown, the official says, is based on simple common sense. In the IMF's view, the industrial countries are the United States, the United Kingdom, most West European nations, Canada, and Japan. A special category called other developed areas includes such other European lands as Finland, Greece, and Ireland, plus Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. The IMF's less developed category embraces all of Latin America and nearly all of the Middle East, non-communist Asia, and Africa. In other words, the backwards countries are those situated in the neo-colonial areas. After quoting figures to support its argument, the Wall Street Journal comments on this situation. Quote, the industrial nations have added nearly $2 billion to their reserves, which now approximate $52 billion. At the same time, the reserves of the less developed group not only have stopped rising, but have declined some 200 million. To analysts such as Britain's Miss War, the significance of such statistics is clear. The economic gap is, rap is rapidly widening between a white, complacent, highly bourgeois, very wealthy, very small North Atlantic elite and everybody else. And this is not a very comfortable heritage to leave to one's children. Everybody else includes approximately two-thirds of the population of the Earth, spread through about 100 nations. 
There is no new problem. In the opening paragraph of his book, The War on World Poverty, written in 1953, the present British labor leader, Mr. Harold Wilson, summarized the major problems of the world as he then saw it. For the vast majority of mankind, quote, the most urgent problem is not war or communism or the cost of living or taxation. It is hunger. Over 1.5 billion people, something like two-thirds of the world's population, are living in condition of acute hunger, defined in terms of identifiable nutritional disease. Surprised the Wall Street Journal would use the term bourgeois. I know, right? Did he say 1.5 billion people, something like two-thirds of the world's population, are living in conditions of acute hunger as of the time of this writing? That's wild defined in terms of identifiable nutritional disease. This hunger is at the same time the effect and the cause of the poverty, squalor, and misery in which they live. Its consequences are likewise understood. The correspondent of the Wall Street Journal previously quoted underlines them. Quote, many diplomats and economists view the uh, implications as overwhelmingly and dangerously political. Unless the present decline can be reversed, these analysts, these analysts fear the United States and other wealthy industrial powers of the West faced the, the, the distinct possibility, in the words of British economist Barbara Ward, quote, of a sort of international class war, close quote. No, oh, yeah, that ship has sailed. <laughs> that ship has sailed a long time ago. What is lacking are any uh, positive proposals for dealing with the situation. All that the Wall Street Journal's correspondent can do is to point out that the traditional methods recommended for curing the evils are only likely to make the situation worse. It has been argued that the developed nation should effectively assist the poor uh, parts of the world and that the whole world should be turned into a welfare state. However, there seems little prospect that anything of this sort can be achieved. The so-called aid programs to help backward economies represent, according to a rough UN estimate, only one half, one percent of the total income of industrial countries. But when it comes to the prospect of increasing such aid, the mood is one of pessimism. A large school of thought holds that expanded share the wealth schemes are idealistic and impractical. This school contains climate, underdeveloped human skills, lack of natural resources, and other factors, not just lack of money, are what retard economic progress in many of these lands. In that, the countries lack personnel with the training or will to use vastly expanded aid effectively. Man, that's some gaslighting shit if I ever heard some gaslighting shit in my life. What the fuck? Share the wealth schemes, according to this view, would be like pouring money down a bottomless well, weakening the donor nations without effectively curing the ills of the recipients. They're literally arguing that, like, they shouldn't materially aid so-called underdeveloped countries in any way because they'll just squander the investment. Like, let's just move on. <laughs> that's wild, though. So the absurdity of this argument is, the stream is demonstrated by the fact that every one of the reasons quoted to prove why the less developed parts of the world cannot be uh, developed apply equally strongly to the present developed countries in the period prior to their development. The argument is, the, is only true in this sense. The less developed world will not become developed through the goodwill or generosity of the developed powers. It can only become developed through a struggle against the external forces which have a vested interest and keeping it underdeveloped. Of these forces, neocolonialism is, at this stage of history, the principle. I propose to analyze neocolonialism, first, by examining the state of the African continent and showing how neocolonialism, at the moment, keeps it artificially poor. Next, I propose to show how, in practice, African unity, which in itself can only be established by the defeat of neocolonialism, could immensely raise African living standards. From this beginning, I propose to examine neocolonialism generally, first historically, and then by a consideration of the great international monopolies who continue, whose continued stranglehold of the neocolonial sectors of the world ensures the continuation of the system. So, like, as a powerful introduction, let me go into the uh, chat. And y'all remember that y'all, uh, if y'all want to, like, chat or y'all want to volunteer to... Uh, say something in response to the reading, you can type stack in the chat room. You can give commentary, such as what Comrade Dictionary is doing. So let's hear what Comrade Dictionary has to say about the introduction, and then I'll share my thoughts. Comrade Dictionary, your thoughts? So it's interesting how 
um Nakuma talks about the need for like um like a like a large organizations in Africa like of countries to sort of like be able to 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 um fight off against like the West and stuff. Um which I guess in hindsight it seems obvious, but I think at the time less so. But like look at the rest of the world. The United States is this huge conglomerate of of both area and people the the you know europe has the eu um and then there's all this western activity to try to split any of that up and he's he'll go into this like in really like minute detail in in uh later chapters about how it's done in africa but we see it done in south america in asia like it's it's a very clear thing that it's it's really bad when other people band together but it's actually not so bad when white people do it um and it's it's very it's very blatant hmm. you're talking about this idea that like working class solidarity is only for the white working class if it's it's something deviant if it's anybody other than the white working class banding together i mean certainly like in america we could never say that um because he, that is a bridge too far for us uh but but yeah essentially like it's it's that idea of like um sort of a labor aristocracy like in the United States, we can sort of band together and we can share our resources to some degree and we can have like, um, you know, unions and stuff, but, but not in other places because we, and what was it he said? Like something totally ridiculous. Like if, if they have any aid or anything, they're just going to waste it. Uh, just, just totally like blatant, absolutely morally bankrupt shit. And it's just said out loud, blows my mind. Yeah, no, you're not even kidding. Cause like, the reality is like how we uh how we even commentate on what's going on in the world quite literally depends on like the racial characteristics of who who's involved. I can't remember. I mean, it must have been Reddit where I saw this video for the first time. But it was like during the Hong Kong protest, and it was like this uh it was this white woman who made the video and she was commenting on like the differences in language when it's like brown people and Asian people and black people protesting versus like, you know, when it's like white people or at the very least, if it's not white people, it's people that the capitalists have deemed to be okay to protest. So like when it's people they don't like, they, they use strong language like riot and thug and looting you know, but when they you when it's people that they're okay with being out in the streets, it's protest, peaceful demonstration, shit like that. You know, and they like try to whitewash any number of leaders uh, historically along the lines of that logic, trying to uh, make people or gaslight people into believing that history tells a different story than it does in terms of what kind of struggles were being in, um, conducted in the streets, so that they can quite literally tell this narrative of marginalized leaders not even being in solidarity with each other and being quite in conflict with each other when as history tells us uh well it's quite a different story you know these leaders often did come into solidarity and hell coming into solidarity with each other and thus uh, forming themselves into an even greater threat to the neo-colonial uh structures that be is what ultimately ends up getting these people killed so yeah yeah that's that's a really strong point for you to bring up, uh, Comrade Dictionary. Yeah, freedom fighters is another thing that they'll fucking use when it's people that they support. Basically called the Global South Welfare Queens with that one. Yeah, it's fucking wild. The people protesting in the service of Western imperialism are freedom fighters and such. Exactly. I mean, goddamn it. How many British flags and American flags and French flags did you see in the Hong Kong protests? Like, of course those were being covered favorably by like the liberal media and like I remember and I shouldn't have like went off as much as I did because it's technically a non-political server but like the way people in the um, NBA subreddit at that time were trying to score woke points is like by trying to give the like woker than thou take on like on China you know people who have like obviously never read a goddamn thing about China from any kind of Marxist perspective in their goddamn lives just giving totally horseshit analysis of what's even going on in the country uh, condemning LeBron for telling people to actually fucking understand the country and shit. I mean a horseshit take because LeBron's a liberal himself God bless him and it was just like super 
uh, cringeworthy how these people literally talked about a country that not only have they never been to, but to the extent that they've ever talked to anybody on it at all, it's always people who are coming at it from a totally liberal point of view. They've never talked to an actual Chinese communist about the actual conditions in China, but they sure as hell will tell you about repression and like, you know, the Chinese working class having like no rights and like no democratic processes. It's, it's, it's really weird actually, uh, how they choose to use China to, 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 sc to score themselves woke points and demoralize. I mean, Gaddafi didn't need to be taken down until he started having success with a Pan-African Union. Absolutely. That's how, that's how they do it. You start to get traction with your own people, and they kill you. I mean, that's how Fred Hampton gets taken out at the ripe old age of 21. You know, <laughs> it's fucking wild. So uh, I regret that when I visited China on business, I had a liberal perspective. I mean, we've all had liberal perspectives, comrade. I mean, fuck. I literally, I, I mean, I was on the Bernie to Marxist pipeline, which necessarily meant that I was at one point on the like, on the like Obama to Bernie pipeline, you know? So like, don't, I wouldn't feel too bad about ever having been a liberal, you know? It's more about what you do once you know than, you know, uh, anything else. So like, just don't go back to being a liberal because they won't have another problem. Did anybody want to start us off on uh, chapter one? Yeah, I can do it. Um, has anybody taken a look at, like, I haven't read this in a long time. Are there words I can't be using? Uh, no, I don't think there's a, there's any uh, strong African language in there. There's no nigga or nothing like that that I can think of. Surely, sure, sure as hell, not as many as there were in the rest of the earth. I almost felt bad for, uh, yeah, or for for like getting white people to read that, but I actually ended up finding it entertaining to see what white people would do whenever they came to that shit. You know, it was all funny, so it's all good. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, one Africa's resources. Africa is a paradox which illustrates and highlights neocolonialism. Her earth is rich, yet the products that come from above and below her soil continue to enrich not Africans predominantly, but groups and individuals who operate to Africa's impoverishment. With a roughly estimated population of 280 million, with 8% of the world's population, Africa accounts for only 2% of the world's total production. Yet even the present very inadequate surveys of Africa's natural resources show the continent to have immense untapped wealth. We know that iron reserves are put at twice the size of America's and two-thirds of those of the Soviet Union's on the basis of an estimated 2 billion metric tons. Africa's calculated coal reserves are considered to be enough to last for 300 years. New petroleum fields are being discovered and brought into production all over the continent. Yet production of primary ores and minerals, considerable as it appears, has touched only the fringes. Africa has more than 40% of the world's potential water power, uh, a greater share than any other continent, yet less than 5% of this volume has been utilized. Even taking into account the vast desert stretches of the Sahara, there is still in Africa more arable and pasture land than exists in either the United States of America or the Soviet Union. There's even more than in Asia. Our forest areas are twice as great as those of the United States. If Africa's multiple resources were used in her own development, they would place her among the modernized continents of the world. But her resources have been and still are being used for the greater development of overseas interests. Africa provided to Britain in 1957 the following proportions of basic materials using her industries. Let's look at this table. So in terms of the following proportions of basic materials used in her industries that Africa reported to Britain, y'all. So let's look at this shit. Tin ore and concentrates, they got 19%. Iron ore, 29%. Manganese, 80%. Copper, 46%. Bauxite, 47%. Chrome ore, 50%. Asbestos, 66%. Cobalt, 82%. Um, antimony, uh, 91%. French, port, French imports from Africa include cotton, 32%. Iron ore, 36%. Zinc ore, 51%. Lead, 85%. And 100% of its phosphates. To Germany, Africa provided 8% of its copper imports, 10% uh, of its iron ore, 12% of its lead ore, 20% uh, of manganese ore, 22% of 
of its um, chrome ore and 71% of its phosphorates. Yet in none of the new African countries is there a single integrated industry based upon any of these resources. Although possessing 53 of the world's most important basic industrial minerals and metals, the African continent tails far behind all others in industrial development. Gauged on the production of primary products output in the total economic activity, by comparison with the country of the most advanced production, the United States of America, the facts can be seen at a glance. Let's look at this table. So, so gauged on the production of primary products output in the total economic activity, by comparison with the country of most advanced production, the United States of America, these facts can be seen at a glance. So, in Algeria, in the year 1958, I'm trying to figure out what these... So what does this data necessarily pertain to? What is it saying this is, Comrade Dictionary? It's like an output of economic activity. So like 21% uh, of the economic activity in Algeria in 1958 was in agriculture, forestry, or fishing. Oh, okay. So like in terms of everything that's going on in the economy, this is like how much of, of that uh, this makes up in the economy, basically. Uh Okay. Right, yeah. So, so, for instance, okay, in Algeria, so, we can see that it's, like, primarily agriculture or public administration, but, like, barely any mining, despite all of that mining still occurring. Like, it's all going elsewhere. They have very little industry and maintenance, um, despite, you know, the rest of the world benefiting heavily from all the stuff taken from Africa. Right. That makes sense. So, with that context in mind, let's take a look at it. So, in Algeria... In 1958, its agriculture, forestry, and fishing industries made up 21% of its economic output. Mining made up 3% of its economic output. Industry and manufacture made up 11% of its output. 6% of it was construction, transport, and communications. Um, commerce, 19%. Public administration and defense uh, and others. So how I'm going to do this going forward is I'll read the statistic or I'll read the output and then I'll just read it by country. That might make it a little bit easier to get through this quickly, y'all. So let's look at agriculture, forestry, and fishing first. Algeria, 21% of its output. Congo, 26% of its output. Kenya, 42% of its output. Morocco, 34%. Nigeria, 63%. Rhodesia, and uh, nice Island, um, 20%. Um, Tanganyika, 59%. The Republic of South Africa, 12%. <laughs> USA, of course, 4%. The good old US of A. The mining industry in Algeria, 3%. The Congo, 16%. Kenya, 1%. Morocco, 6%. Nigeria, 1%. Rhodesia and Neosaland, 14%. Tanganyika, 4%. Republic of South Africa, uh, 13%. USA, 1%, of course. Industry and manufacture. 11% in Algeria, 12% in the Congo, 10% in Kenya, 18% in Morocco, uh, 2% in Nigeria, 11% in Rhodesia and Iceland, uh, 11%. Uh, Tanganyika, uh, 7%. Republic of South Africa, 2%. USA, 30% in terms of industry and manufacture. Construction, 6% in Algeria. Congo, 6%. Kenya, 4%, Morocco, 4%, Nigeria, uh, 11%, Rhodesia and Neosaland, 8%, Tanganyika, 6%, Republic of South Africa, 5%, USA, uh, uh, 5%. Transport and communications, we got Algeria at 6%, Congo at 9%, Kenya at 9%, Morocco at, apparently that's none of its output in 1958, Nigeria, 1%. Rhodesia and Nyasaland, 9%. Tanganyika, 7 Republic of South Africa, 8%. USA, 8%. Then we got commerce. Algeria, its output is 19% in 1958. In 1958, you got the Congo at 7%. 13 for Kenya. We're talking about commerce still. 15% Morocco. Nigeria, 4%. Rhodesia and Nyasaland, 9%. Or I'm sorry, ten percent rather. Tanganyika five, Republic of South Africa twelve, USA seventeen. Then you got the public administration and defense. 
And with the USA, this the years for all of these statistics is 1959, and for the African countries, it's 1958. So keep that in mind. So public administration and defense: Algeria, 22 percent; Congo, 14 percent; Kenya, 10 percent; Morocco, 10 percent; Nigeria, six; Rhodesia and Nyasaland, four. Uh, Tanganyika, 7. Republic of South Africa, 10. USA, 13. And then there's other industries that make up various percentages as well. So there's like all kinds of looting that's going on. Because like just to know that 30% of the American industry is necessarily uh, or economy is industry and manufacturing already suggests like the rampant funding of American empire by imperialism because what even goes into industry and manufacturing? Like, what are those jobs? Those are like rubber jobs, steel jobs, resources that you don't necessarily find naturally here in the States. Uh, I was just having a conversation the other day about uh, how Trump got elected in 2016. And one of the things that he was uh, elected on is this idea that the Democrats in the 90s um, and their trade deals in terms of stuff like NAFTA and then later on in the, two, in the early 2000s, pursuing stuff like the TPP necessarily outsourced their jobs. But when you look at it materially, the jobs lost were jobs that, without the logic of colonialism and imperialism wearing its head, wouldn't have been here anyway. Because, like, how the fuck are you going to find a rubber production job in countries that don't naturally produce rubber? Yet, that's what my hometown, Akron, lost. Uh, steel mills in Pittsburgh, shit like that. So, like, when you when you see people calling for a demand for those jobs back, that necessarily means they're calling for those jobs to be once again looted from the global south because that's where those jobs came from in the first place, where they were when they were here. Uh, that's that's a grim reality to to look, to look at because we know what it would take for those jobs to come back, and we know whose expense it would be at. So. Think about that shit. Did you want to continue on, Comrade Dictionary? Yeah, before I do, one thing that um, to think about, too, like these numbers are already bad, but you're comparing the United States of America as a whole compared to just single, smaller entities in Africa, and it's still bleak. Like, imagine these numbers added up across the entirety of Africa. Exactly. Like, that's the thing. This is what... This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine African countries, and the numbers are still bleak, you know, and obviously there's a hell of a lot more than nine African countries. So there you go. You can continue on, Comrade Dictionary. It will be noted that in America, agriculture, forestry, and fishing provide a mere 4% of the total national activity and mining a trifling 1%. On the other hand, industry, manufacturing, and commerce provide four, uh, 47%. In the African countries included in this table, which are, uh, with the exception of Nigeria, those with the highest settler communities and therefore the most exploited, agriculture is predominant. Industry, manufacture, and commerce lag far behind. Even in the case of South Africa, the most highly industrialized sector of the African continent, the contribution of agriculture, 12%, and mining, 13%, are equal to those of industry, manufacture, and construction put together. However, on the whole, Mining has provided a most profitable venture for foreign capital investments in, in Africa. Its benefits for Africans have by no means been on an equal scale. Mining production in a number of African countries has a value of less than $2 per head of population. As uh, Europe, France, Outremer puts it, it is quite certain that a mining production of $1 to $2 per inhabitant cannot appreciably affect a country's standard of living. Affirming correctly that in the zones of exploitation, the mining industry introduces a higher standard of living. The journal is forced to the conclusion that mining exploitations are, however, relatively privileged, isolated islands in a very poor total economy. The reason for this is seen in the absence of industry and, man and manufacture, owing to the fact that mining production is destined principally for exportation, mainly in a primary form. It goes to feed the industries and factories of Europe and Africa, uh, Europe and America to the impoverishment of the countries of origin. It is also remarked by Europe, France, Outremer that about 50% of Africa's mining production remains in the country of origin as wages. Even the most cursory glance at the annual accounts of the mining companies refutes this claim. 
the excess of revenue over expenditure in many cases proves conclusively by its size that wages received by manual labor form by no means such an exaggerated proportion of value produces 50%. The considerable sums which go in highly paid salaries to European staffs in the skilled and administrative categories, part of which is returned to their own countries, must in many instances amount to the total received by African laborers, to say nothing of the large amounts which swell the yearly incomes of wealthy directors who reside in the metropolitan cities of the West. The assumption also ignores another important fact, namely that wages of manual workers, low as they are, are partly spent on goods manufactured abroad and imported, taking out of the primary producing countries a good part of the workers' wages. In many cases, the imported goods are the products of the companies associated with the mining groups. Frequently, they are sold in the company's own stores on the mining compounds or by their appointed agents, the workers having to pay prices fixed by the companies. The poverty of the people of Africa is demonstrated by the simple fact that income per capita is among the lowest in the world. Well, I'll read this chart, Comrade Dictionary. Do you mind pulling up some inflation statistics to compare this stuff to? Sure. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, so income per capita, U, um, U.S. dollars, 1960 to 1963. Under $80. Boston Land, Burundi, Land, Chad, Congo, Dahomey, Ethiopia, Guinea, the South, Malawi, Mali, Malik, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, Somalia, Tanganyika, and Zanzibar, Uganda, Vatarik Republic. They're all under eighty dollars per capita between um, 1960 and 1963. Eighty-one to 125 dollars. Angola, uh, Angola. Cameroon Republic, the Congo, uh, Gambia, uh, Guinea, Kenya, the Malagasy Republic, uh, Marlotania, Sierra Leone, Sudan, uh, Sudan, Togo, and the United Arab Republic. Those are all between 81 and 125, again, between 1960 and 1963. Then you got between $126 and $200. Liberia, Libya, Morocco, Swaziland, and Tunisia. Between two hundred and two hundred and fifty dollars, Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Gabon, Ghana, Mauritius, Senegal, Southwest Africa, Zambia, Rhodesia, which that we which we call Zimbabwe, and the only one over four hundred dollars per capita between nineteen sixty and nineteen sixty three is South Africa. Do you have a uh, so fifty dollars in nineteen sixty dollars today? A hundred dollars in nineteen sixty dollars today. So the fifty dollars, so fifty dollars in nineteen sixty money is four hundred and fifty four dollars and seventy two cent in today's money. A hundred dollars in nineteen sixty dollars today is nine hundred and nine dollars and forty four cents. So let's see, if you're making a hundred dollars a month, you're making about nine hundred and nine dollars a month in nineteen sixty to nineteen sixty three. That is. Jesus, that's 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 terrible. Go ahead and continue on, uh, Comrade Dictionary. I'm trying to see how. To, let's see, it's income per capita. The Aaron, that's is, yearly. Yeah, that's yearly. That's yearly. Jesus Christ! It's these people were making. So these people were making. What were you saying? If you're making a hundred dollars, you're making the equivalent of nine hundred dollars a year, basically. What the actual fuck? How are these people supposed to make a fucking living? Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I almost stopped earlier when they were talking about how, like, ah, actually, mining uh, raises people's standard of living, and it was, like, $2 a day. <laughs> like, Jesus <geez>, Christ. <laughs> what the actual fuck? I'm flabbergasted. Like, I don't even know what the fuck to say to that. $900 a year? Jesus Christ. $900 a year will, like, pay my like three times that's about it you know and that's with a roommate and living in like a relatively cheap area you know that's crazy as hell uh, i mean this is part of how we keep other countries down right like huge portions of the population are by necessity required to do subsistence farming just to survive because they don't make enough money because we swipe all their resources and their labor and export it out to the west uh it's okay so, so unconscionable so, 
So what was four hundred dollars in nineteen sixty? Four hundred. Uh, so you're looking at what is that? Eighteen. That I'm terrible at math. Uh, thirty six hundred. Thirty six hundred dollars a year. Jesus Christ. Yeah, not great. No. No, I mean they're living large in South Africa on their thirty six hundred dollars a year though. You know, that's 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 wild. It funds the European welfare state and our standards of living such as they are. That's wild as fuck. Uh did anybody and else to add insult to injury, you have uh Western expats who take all the 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 largesse that they've accrued from living in the West and then go to these countries and like also benefit from the lower standards of living to like live large on less it's the worst oh, oh wow you're talking about like capital accumulation and then you know living living somewhere else so all that labor you exploited you could then go you can then make it stretch further by live by moving to a country that you helped colonize right yeah like i could take you know my job's fully remote so if i wanted i could move to like the philippines right which has a much lower standard of living and live extremely well and my wage would stay the same and my access to resources would stay largely the same um but i would just be taking up that much more of people in the philippines in this example and it is wow. by means a small like this is a very common thing people do it especially in like um southeast asia um but also in in africa or even in western europe as well i mean it, it happens there um it's America's bad, man. Oh yeah, no, it's no America's not a good place. So, and and, and you're and, and you shared it before. You're damn near a six figure earner, right? So you basically be living like a king in most of the global south. Yeah, like imagine that if if I if I went to like somewhere in Africa, right, and it was like the average person was making nine hundred dollars a day or nine hundred dollars a year, and like on my salary, that would be stupid, right? Like it would be ridiculous. But I could do that. I could do that, and that, and the world would reward me for it, which is beyond belief. See, that's just the ugly logic of imperialism bearing its head. That's wild, because, like, you know, that's wild as fuck. Because, like, I make, between, like, all the different, like, state help that I get, I probably make, like, $600 a month, give or take, you know? And, like, that's nothing, but it's, like, enough to, like, keep the lights on. But shit, apparently there are countries in the world where I could go on even that meager amount of money a month and be, like, way better off than I am in the, in the fucking states. Like, that's... But that's not a good thing. That's a condemnation of the logic of colonialism. That's... That's... that's Wow, that's awful. All right, Comrade Dictionary, go for it. Just another, like, very brief thing that I was thinking about as I was reading this. So they were talking about, like, how all these resources are stolen from Africa and, like, very little is actually seen by the people. And I remember seeing these videos of these um, like cocoa farmers, um, I think in the Ivory Coast, who had like never actually seen a chocolate bar or eaten one. And they spend their entire lives growing it. Yeah, no, there's no word for that shit. I remember reading a comment by Henry Ford that said something along the lines that like, you should never have workers producing something that you don't pay them enough to be able to actually use in, 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 in regards to obviously Fords at that time and like apparently among the capitalist class that's pretty progressive logic because that sure as hell doesn't seem to be the case like many GM workers these days can, def can definitely not afford a car which is like the most wild thing so uh yeah Queen you can go ahead and read comrade in some countries for example Gabon and Zambia up to half the domestic product is paid to resident expatriates and to overseas, firm, overseas firms who own the plantations and mines. In Guinea-Bissau, Angola, Libya, Swaziland, Southwest Africa, and Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, foreign firm profits and settler or expatriate incomes exceed one-third of the domestic product. Algeria, Congo, and Kenya were in this group before independence. On achieving independence, almost every new state of Africa has developed plans for industrialization and rounded economic growth in order to improve productive capacity and thereby raise the standard of living of its people. But while Africa remains divided, progress is bound to be painfully slow. 
Economic development is dependent not only on the availability of natural resources and the size and population of a country, but on the economic size, which takes into account both population and income per capita. In many African states, the population and per capita products are extremely small, giving an economic unit no larger than a medium-sized firm in a Western capitalist country or a single state enterprise in a European socialist economy. Africa is having to pay a huge price once more for the historical accident that this vast and compact continent brought fabulous profits to Western capitalism. First out of the trade and its people, then out of the imperialist exploitation. This enrichment of one side of the world out of the exploitation of the other has left the African economy without the means to industrialize. At the time when Europe passed into its industrial revolution, there was a considerably narrower, narrower gap in the development between continents. But with every step in the evolution of productive methods and the increased profits drawn from the more and more shrewd investment in manufacturing equipment and base metal production, the gap, wi the gap widened by leaps and bounds. The report of the UN Economic Commission for Africa, published in December 1962 under, under the title of Industrial Growth in Africa, states that the gap between continents separated by the Mediterranean has widened faster during the 20th century than ever before. True, per capita output has increased in Africa, particularly in the last two decades, which have seen an increase of some 20, 10 to 20%. Already far ahead, the industrial countries have marked a per capita advance in the same period of 60%, and their per capita industrial pr production may be estimated as high as 25 times that in Africa as a whole. The difference for a greater part of Africa, however, is even more marked since industry on this continent tends to be concentrated in small areas in the north and south. A real transformation of the African economy would mean not only doubling agricultural output, but increasing industrial output some 25 times. The report makes it plain that industry rather than agriculture is the means by which rapid improvement in Africa's li living standards is possible. There are, however, imperialist specialists and apologists who urge the less developed countries to concentrate on agriculture and leave industrialization for some later time when their populations shall be well fed. The world's economic development, however, shows that it is only with advanced industrialization that it has, that it has been possible to raise the nutritional level of the people by raising their levels of income. Agriculture is important for many reasons, and the governments of African states concer excuse me, concerned with bringing higher standards to their people are devoting greater investment to agriculture. But even to make agriculture yield more, the aid of industrial output is needed, and the underdeveloped world cannot forever be placed at the mercy of the more industrialized. This dependence must slow the rate of increase in our agriculture and make it subservient to the demands of the industrial producers. That is why we cannot accept such sweeping assessments as that made by Professor Leopold G. Shield of the Vienna School of Economics at a recent meeting in London of the International Geo Geographical Congress. Commented Professor Shield, people in developing countries seem to think that all is necessary for them to become wealthy as the West is to build factories. Most experts agree that it is wiser and more promising to develop agriculture into self-sufficiency and on to the level of mark and marketing economy. The Times, July 24th, 1964. This train of thought links up directly with that of the chairman of Booker Brothers, Sir Jock Campbell, whose combine of companies is busy monopolizing sugar and byproduct industries in, in British Guyana, shipping and trading in the Caribbean and East Africa, and is now penetrating into the west of the African continent. Sir Jock Campbell asserted at the annual address 
of the African Bureau in London on November 29, 1962, that agriculture was the basis of African development and that plantations were an effective method of increasing economic potential. He considered that so long as industrialized agriculture employed men free to come and go, it was preferable in terms both of efficiency and liberty to the communized collective farming whose results had fallen short of expectation both in Russia and China. The Times, November 30th, 1962. He does not seem to have convinced the sugar workers of British Guyana. And it is a moot point whether he has been able to impress the benefits of his free to come and go plantation philosophy on the workers for his company in Naya. Nyasa land, Rhodesia, and South Africa. Even the scientific supporters of the imperialist pattern are aware of their flaws and their injunctions, but they cunningly attribute the emphasis placed by the developing states upon industrialization to political ambitions rather than to economic and social necessity. A European representative of the University of Malaya Mr. D.W. Fryer, speaking at the meeting of the International Ge Geographical Conference, to which reference is made above, said that an increase in the efficiency of traditional export industries in the underdeveloped countries was an obvious move, but it was politically unattractive. It suggested continued acceptance in the old colonial economy. Industrialism was an integral part of the nationalist movement. Its mainspring was not economic, but political, and political expediency was often more important than economic efficiency in the location of new industry. The more efficient management of primary production and improvement on a marketing level is imperialism's gain and our loss. The point has been made quite clearly by no less a person than the chairman of BOSA, the Bank of London and South America, Sir George Bolton. The latter was reported in the Financial Times of March, March 6, 1964, as being confident of a rise in commodity prices, which would have a con which had have considerable effect on foreign exchanges. For whose benefit? Sir George provides the answer. It should help the reserve currencies sterling in dollar, he said. Why? Because being tied to these currencies, the primary producers will be accumulating their surpluses in sterling and dollar balances. This appears to be nothing short of a direct confession of the major interest of the banking and financial world in the exploitation of the developing countries. It is in interesting, therefore, to note that BOLSA's transfer agents in London are Patino Mines and Enterprises Consolidated the American-controlled combined operating mines in Latin America and Canada, and intimately associated with the groups engaged in, in, in exploiting Africa's natural resources. We are certainly not against marketing and trading. On the contrary, we are for a widening of our potentialities in these spheres, and we are convinced that we shall be able to adjust the balance in our favor only by developing an ag agriculture attuned to our needs and supporting it with a rapidly increasing industrialization that will break the neo-colonialist pattern at which present operates. Co a continent like Africa, however much it increases its agricultural output, will not benefit unless it is sufficiently politically and economically united to force the developed world to pay it a fair price for its cash crops. To give one illustration, both Ghana and Nigeria have in the post-war independence period enormously developed their production of cocoa, as the table on page 10 shows. This result has not been attained by chance. It is the consequence of heavy eternal expenditure on control of disease and pests the subsiding of insecticides and the spraying machines provided to farmers, and the importing of new varieties of cocoa seedlings, which are resistant to the endemic ills which previous cocoa trees had developed. By means such as these, Africa as a whole greatly increased her cocoa production, while that of 
Latin America remains stationary. What advantage has Nigeria or Ghana gained through this stupendous increase in agricultural productivity? In 1954 and 55, when Ghana's production was 200, 210,000 tons, her 1954 earnings from the cocoa crop were 85, 85 and a half million pounds. This year, 1964, is that pounds? I don't know. <laughs> this year, 1964, 1965, with an estimated crop of 500 and 590,000 tons, the estimated external earnings will be around 77 million pounds. Nigeria suffered a similar experience. In 1954 and 1955, she produced 89,000 tons of beans and received for her crop 39 and a fourth million pounds. In 1965, it is estimated that Nigeria will produce 310,000 tons and is likely to receive for it around 40 million pounds. What the actual fuck? Are you serious? <laughs> How much for how much did they? Oh, yeah. So, eighty nine thousand tons of beans for thirty nine and a half million, but Nigeria produces three hundred thousand ten thousand tons and is likely to receive forty pounds. What the fuck? Wow, that's not even subtle with the imperialism at that point. That's just that's just blatant, and then. What was it? So you were saying, in other words, Ghana and Nigeria have trebled their production of this particular agricultural product, but their gross earnings from it have fallen from 125 million pounds to 117 million pounds. Oh, that's that's wild. Thanks for the for the reading, Queen. You're uh, welcome. Appreciate you. Uh, let's let's go over some of what Queen was reading because she was going over quite a lot of interesting shit. So like. Where was that admission where they were basically confessing to what the logic of capital is? So, like, one of the tenets of modern monetary theory, which isn't even something Marxists subscribe to, obviously, is this idea that anything could necessarily uh, serve as fiat currency and governments themselves decide what they will accept as fiat currency and then conscript laws around that so that um, you have to pay for your uh, that you, so that you have to pay your taxes in the in the governmentally decided uh, currency. And the reason they do this is for the logic of being able to participate in uh, the global economy, or at least that's one of the main reasons that they do so. Uh, they'll tell you that the reason uh, that they do that is so that um, markets can operate more efficiently, not having to scramble around when it comes to like, you know, whose currency is the valid cur currency, but that itself is horseshit. But like they've taken the logic a little further and have made it so that even internationally speaking, to engage in trade and investment, uh, that this itself must be done in the currencies that uh, the imperialistic neocolonial powers uh, decide to uh, use. So if you cannot tap in to the markets that necessarily uh, let those neocolonial uh, notes uh, flow, uh, you don't have any chance to grow in the neocolonial uh, world that we live in, a la Cuba a la uh, the DPRK, et cetera. So it's really interesting how they're literally quite saying, they're literally talking about tying countries up in that currency so that they can't get out from having to deal with colonialist powers. But if you want to facilitate development, what choice do you have other than to play the game? This is, that's the logic they're going by. Uh, Comrade Dictionary. So the money thing gets worse. Uh, so for many of the African nations, um, the, the IMF or individual Western countries stipulate all sorts of rules for how they can get aid. And because of the way the countries have been cut up, most of them need aid. Um, so for instance, if you are an African country that is looking to get 
um, aid from France, you have to keep like a certain percentage of all your your wealth in French banks so that they keep all that money. Uh, it, it's utterly sadistic. Wow. Like, how the fuck are you supposed to engage if like France decides to cut you off, though? Well, that's the thing. You're not you're not allowed to, to do anything that France wouldn't like. That would be bad for you. Yeah, like that's the point, right? Like your investments and your productivity is tied up in our banks and we'll hold on to your we'll hold on to that for you. And as long as you like do what we tell you to do, then there's nothing for you to fucking worry about. But of course, of course interest clash. And I mean, at what point does a country feel forced to risk being cut off? Like, you know, what more is a sanction than the U.S. simply withholding assets that it's already seized or, you know, or refusing to give back that which it forced a country to hand over in the first place or so-called invest? Because, like, what you end up seeing with these sanctions oftentimes is that an investment was made, and it gets it comes time to get to get shit paid back. And when it's time to pay a country back, all of a sudden, the America wants to ramp up the sanctions and hold on to another country's money under this guise of a human rights violation. That guise of a human rights violation. One of the more hilarious examples of that was Obama's 2015 Iran deal, where one of the tenets of that was America literally negotiating with Iran using money that it had taken from Iran, uh, saying, we'll give you your money back if you agree not to enrich your uranium to the point of nuclear production. You're only allowed to enrich it, you know, to the point that it can power your grid. And what did the neoliberal media do? They ran around saying, oh, Obama's weak because, you know, he's literally paying, he's literally investing in Iran. He's paying Iran. When literally he was agreeing to release a hold on money and investment that had been seized from that country. It's absolutely asinine the way these people operate. Let's see. What we got here? Oh, you're looking at nationalizing industry? Sure, it would be a shame if you couldn't access your money that we required you to put in our banks. Exactly. That's how it works. Bank of England wouldn't release the gold they held for Venezuela, like two billion pounds or something. According to them, they needed it for the pandemic. No, that's how the logic works. I mean, it's it's utterly asinine. And then, and this is why I'm like always bringing up, taking a look at what kind of rhetoric is being ramped up when any kind of like so-called progressive policy is being proposed. Because like I've talked to y'all about before, like that 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 Green New Deal shit was as it was like hitting the mainstream and becoming a more popular idea. We were wrapping up the propaganda against Bolivia and Evo at the same damn time. And lo and behold, who has the largest lithium reserves in the world? It's fucking Bolivia. You know, the lithium ion reserves. And of course you need lithium ion. It's one of the big resources that AOC's Green New Deal was talking about uh, getting access to. But when they talk about getting access to these markets, they're quite literally talking about doing imperialism in somebody else's fucking country. It's absurd. You know, it's absurd, but it's not subtle. That's the thing about it. How much does France make in French-speaking Africa? I recommend looking into this for seeing a bit about France's neo-colonial enterprise on the African continent. Can you uh go ahead and pin that, Lefty? I uh, appreciate you. Go ahead and pin that. So I'm going to read these last five pages. Uh, so we would have got through the introduction in chapter one. We're making good progress. So let's get to it. Man, some of that shit that Queen was reading was fucking wild. Because one of the so that one quote, a continent like Africa, however much it produces its agricultural, it increases its agricultural output, will not benefit unless it is sufficiently politically and economically united to force the developed world to pay at a fair price for its cash crops. And that's super important because we she was literally just going over the statistics. They that data said that for about the same amount of money. In 1954 to 1955, there was a difference of, let's see, about three tons more beans 
ended up being the equivalent of about a million more pounds. Like that's that's absurd. That's that's, that's absolutely unacceptable. But that is the logic of imperialism playing out right before our eyes. You know, the uh, they will charge former colonies for infrastructure they build. Oh man, let's wrap this up, y'all. So. And there's another chart in here for cocoa bean production, but I won't cite that here. It's no, it's, I just wanted to note that it that it's there so that I um, acknowledge it. A detailed study of production and price shows that it is developed cons- the developed consuming country, which obtains the advantage of the increased production and the less developed um, one. So long as African agricultural producers are disunited they will be unable to control the market price of their primary products. An experience with the Cocoa Producers Alliance has shown any organization which is based on a mere commercial agreement between primary producers is insufficient to secure a fair world price. This can only be obtained when the united power of the producer countries is harnessed by common political and economic policies and has behind it the united financial resources of the state's concern. Lekin says, all of this is still true today, and it's somewhat interesting to see the ways in which the current African states try to work around all the issues brought up with neocolonialism. Absolutely. Like, how do you even continue to operate a country while at the same time being forced to engage in this, like, finance capital horseshit? Like, goddamn. And that's to say nothing of the, of the people who are out here talking about finance and capital and investment in another country at all being a sign of imperialism because that like necessarily leads into an entirely deeper conversation about who is and who isn't engaging in imperialism out here like it's it's such a jumbled fucking mess you know it's wild so an experience with the cocoa producers alliance has shown any organization which is based on a mere commercial agreement between primary producers is insufficient to secure a fair world price. This can only be obtained obtained when the united power of the producer countries is harnessed by common political and economic policies and has behind it the united financial resources of the state's concerns. Oh man, the media doesn't even toe the line of imperialism. The, the you know, the media draws the line of imperialism and then you know, hopscotch skips right over it. Like, that's how the fucking media treats imperialism. They're like, the line, fuck your line, you know. Here's what we think about your line, you know. So, yeah, you're, you're like, yeah, you're, you're right, Jamie, but like, it's, that's an understatement. So long as the African countries divide it, it remains divided, it will therefore be the wealthy consumer countries who will dictate the price of African cash crops. Nevertheless, even if Africa could dictate the price of its cash crops, this would not by itself provide the balanced economy which is necessary for development. The answer must be industrialization. The African continent, however, cannot hope to industrialize it effectively in the haphazard, laissez-faire manner of Europe. In the first place, there is the time factor. In the second, the socialized modes of production and tremendous human and capital investments involved call for cohesive and integrated planning. Africa will need to bring to its aid all its latent ingenuity and talent in order to meet the challenge that independence and the demands of its people for better living have raised. The challenge cannot be met on any uh, piecemeal scale, but only by the the total mobilization of the continent's resources within the framework of comprehensive socialist planning and development. We have noted that in the countries of the highest settler populations, and therefore the most exploited so far in Africa, Algeria, Congo, Kenya, Morocco, Rhodesia, Malawi, South Africa, Tanganyika, agriculture is predominant. In the case of South Africa, the most highly developed area of the African continent, the contribution of agriculture and mining is together equal to that of industry, manufacture, and construction. South Africa's economy is heavily bolstered by the export of its mining output. Gold contributes up to 70% of the total exports which makes the economy, for all its apparent boom, and the heavily increasing foreign investment, basically almost as insecure as that of the less developed countries of the continent. For all its pushing secondary industries, its chemicals manufacture, military production, steel processing, and the rest, South Africa has so far failed to lay down on the basis of solid industrialization. G.E. Manel, chairman of Anglo-Transvaal Consolidated Investment Company, 
talk about a goddamn mouthful of Jesus Christ. Anglo Transvail Consolidated Investment Company. Like, you lost me at Anglo, honestly, which controls gold, diamonds, and uranium, and made a most telling statement in his annual address on the December 6, 1963. That's what? Two weeks after JFK's head, the wig gets split to the Johannesburg shareholders meeting. The nation's economy is based to a significant degree on on wasting assets, the gold mines of the Transvaal and Orange Free State. We have become more and more aware of this in recent years as more mines near the end of their lives without any sign of new large gold fields, in spite of the many millions being spent on uh, exploration. Investment in South Africa's economy comes mainly from Western capital, with which local finance, not hardly enough to stand on its own feet, is strongly bound. Quick profits are the incentive, so that while Anglo Transvaal's chairman sees the danger to the economy, he was nonetheless happy to be able to advance the record profits were again achieved in 1963. The whole of the economy is geared to the interests of the foreign capital that dominates it. South Africa's banking institutions, like those of most other African states, are offshoots of the Western banking and financial houses. South Africa is dominated by Western monopoly even more than by any other sector of the continent, because the investments are many times greater and the dependence upon gold and other mining as the center of the economy gears it inextricably to that monopoly. Its vulnerability is intensified by the fact that it is a supplier of crude and semi-finished products to the factories of the West on a larger scale than the West, rest of Africa, and an earner of greater profits for their financial backers. Nigeria tells in a few basic figures a tale of a different kind of economic maladjustment. In 1960, agriculture, forestry, and fishing accounted for 63% of the economic activity, mining 1%. The imbalance is emphasized by the extremely low ratio of 2% for industry and manufacture, eliminating that um, once any comparison with the 1% contribution of mining and 4% of agriculture to America's total economic product. In the case of the United States, this low proportion supports a vast superstructure of industry and manufacture. In Nigeria, it connotes simply a total disregard of the colonialism of Nigeria's potentialities. The reason for this lies not in the fact that Nigeria is devoid of natural industrial resources, as recent findings of oil and iron confirm. It was that Nigeria's agriculture provided greater profitability uh, for European investment than the risk that were, man, that were involved in the large colonial provisions called for by mining exploration and exploitation. In 1962, petroleum and petroleum products contributed, what is that, 99% Nigeria's exports, but it is Shell BP that hopes to reap most of the benefits. The bulk of these exports was in crude oil, exceeding 3 million tons. Jesus Christ. The oil company is aiming at an export target of 5 million tons of crude oil by 1965. Processing plants are in Europe, not in Nigeria. The oil refinery going up in Port Harcourt is owned by Shell BP. The natural gas piping is owned by Shell Barclays DC. And, oh, the oil refinery is meant to handle only 10% of Nigeria's crude. It's owned by Shell BP. Oh, crude oil output. And its product will serve only Nigeria's domestic market. Such an arrangement makes it possible not to disturb operations outside Niger Nigeria while making super profits on Nigerian operations. Generally speaking, in spite of the exploration costs, which are written off for tax purposes anyway and many times covered by eventual profits, mining has proved a very profitable venture for foreign capital investment in Africa. Its benefits for the African, on the other hand, despite all the frothy talk to the contrary, has been negligible. This is explained by the absence of industry and manufacture uh, based upon the use of domestic natural resources and of the trade that is there uh, concomitant. Uh, for mining purposes, or for mining production, is destined principally for exportation in its primary form. Certain exceptions to the generalization are found in South Africa, Zambia, and the Congo. Some small conversion has been taking place also in countries like Morocco, Algeria, and Mozambique. South Africa's copper is exported in the form of metal and a small part of its iron is sent overseas as ingots. Its gold is refined. But for these exceptions, 
Most exported minerals are shipped from Africa in their primary state. They go to feed the industries and plants of Europe, America, and Japan. The ore that is to be produced in Swaziland by the Swaziland Iron Ore uh, Development Company, owned jointly by Anglo-American Corporation and the powerful British Steel Group, Guest Keen and Nettlefolds, will go at the rate of 1.2 million tons annually for 10 years from 1964 to a Japanese steel combine. When the countries of their origin are obliged to buy back their minerals and other raw products in the form of finished goods, they do so at grossly inflated prices. A General Electric advertisement carried in the March to April 1962 issue of Modern Government informs us that from the heart of Africa to the hearth of the world, steel, world steel mills comes out ore for stronger steel, better steel, steel for buildings, machinery, and more steel rails. With this steel from Africa, General Electric supplies transportation for bringing out another valuable mineral for its own use and that of other government um, great imperialist exploiters. In lush verbiage, the same advertisement describes how deep in the tropical jungle of center of Central Africa lies one of the world's richest deposits of manganese ore. But is it for Africa's needs? Not at all, of course. The site which is being developed by the French concern, Cabigny Menier del Agoui, uh, probably botched the fuck out of that, is located on the upper ridge of the Agoui River in the Gabon Republic. After the ore is mined, it will first be carried 50 miles by cableway. Then it will be transferred to ore cars and hauled 300 miles by diesel-electric locomotives to the port of Point Nord for shipment to the world steel mills. For the world read, the United States first and France second. The exploitation of this nature can take place as due to the balkanization of the African continent. Balkanization is the major instrument of neo neocolonialism and will be found wherever neocolonialism is practiced. Jesus Christ, that's a hell of a claim at the end. Is the United States balkanized, y'all? We'll have to read chapter two to find out. So did anybody want to share some thoughts on those that final section that we were reading there? As well as the exploitation of the people of Africa. Uh, it is environmentally destructive. Would be better to process narrators. Uh, so Comrade Dictionary, of course, in his uh, dictionary ways, posted a definition of concomitant, which is naturally accompanying or associated. So I hadn't heard that before. So appreciate that, Comrade. No, this was this was this was good shit to start with y'all. So we've established just how bad the exploitation is. Uh, he's even given working definitions of colonialism, and he's given examples of exactly uh, what that exploitation looks like in, 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 in real practice. So what were some of the examples that he was bringing up here? He was talking about Shell BP, hoping to reap most of the benefits of Nigeria's petroleum uh, products and petroleum exports. He mentioned Let's see, 1960, agriculture, forestry, and fishing accounted for 63% of the economic activity, mining 1%. But, like, even though mining necessarily, I mean, we, we did the ore stats earlier. Ore is 1% of the activity, but, like, look how much of the ore that those countries import is sourced from Africa. And it just then paints a clear picture to just how b broad the scope of the exploitation is. And he says, wherever you see, Selectin so says, wherever you see a map of a non-Western country carved up, it's likely the vision of an imperialist somewhere. I mean, yeah, there's that one so-called socialist that I won't mention by name because I won't give them the benefit of being, having their name graced by my fucking lips, who was quite literally always posting maps of a balkanized U.S. carved up in his settler colonial socialist uh, worldview. That is quite literally always trying to poison any kind of decolonial discourse. Like this motherfucker that I'm mentioning quite literally has a page where you can go through the images and you'll be able to find like his, his conceptualizations and like his arguing with Africans about the idea that like a fucking white socialist could ever draw any kind of map that like carves up the U.S. as if it's the fucking Europeans country to even fucking carve up in the first place like this there's some sick shit that goes on y'all so let's see also where Kwame was writing this um there was around 52 african countries now there are 55 which uh 
which three African countries weren't formerly countries yet at the time left in them? Do you know? How are you going to be a socialist and say actually separating people up is the way to go? Yeah, it's it's wild. Like the whole point is us working to God is to be goddamn better. Yeah, I'll just stay away from balkanization of the U.S. discourse because there's literally nothing productive. I mean, that's the uh, Eritrea. I think South Sudan was after this as well. Yeah, because like balkanization of the of the of the U.S. discourse just necessarily leads to takes such as quote actually referring to settlers as settlers is like inaccurate because they killed all the fucking college, uh, all the, all of the indigenous people. And now they're the, the new indigenous people and they've changed the relationship to the land. Therefore settler is inaccurate. Close quote. That's how you get, that's, that's the kind of shit that you get when you, when you do balkanization of the U S discourse. So it's like not worth any, it's not, it's not worth your time. You'd be better served watching paint dry or picking lint out of your pocket and eating it for sustenance rather than engaging in that fucking discourse. So, yeah, it's wild. But we're going to go ahead and wrap up, y'all. We've been here a little while. We got to almost two hours. We finished that introduction and that chapter two. I mean, chapter one. So we'll be, we'll be doing chapter two and possibly chapter three as well next week. In terms of what's coming up this week, tomorrow we got at noon EST, Walter Rotney's How Europe underdeveloped Africa. So y'all got that to look forward to and we'll be continuing our Michael Parenti reading on Saturday. In addition, we're going to start looking at ways to like just, you know, build more community with y'all uh, so that we can just quite literally, you know, spend time and shit. We're looking at doing like a community game nights on Thursdays. So that's something y'all uh, have forward to look to. And there's like a couple, there's like a very specific project that some comrades and I have been conceptualizing and it's like still being worked out in terms of like how we can do it um, logistically and in a practical way. But like, I think y'all will like what we have to share when we do it. In addition, we're still going to do black non-man theory Wednesdays. At this point, we're literally just looking for, well, a black non-man who wants to facilitate and lead a discussion on Angela Davis's woman racing class, you know, since that would be the most appropriate thing to happen. So when we have somebody who wants to do that, we'll go ahead and do it because like a couple of people have fallen through. So that's been unfortunate, but we'll, we'll, we'll get somebody who wants to facilitate and lead that discussion for y'all. So y'all got a lot to look forward to in Bread Theory. I know it's the summer, but it's about to be more active in here than it's ever been. And I appreciate you, new, the new comrades who come in and the comrades who have been here the whole time. So until tomorrow. I love y'all comrades. Solidarity always. And we will see y'all tomorrow for Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Ta-ta for now, y'all.